Cool. I think this is the mic right here. Awesome. So, you got a day off finally. We've been playing email tag for <laughs> a few weeks now. Yeah. You got a day off. How is it? How does it feel? Uh, it feels feels good. Yeah, the restaurant is a, it's a lot of work, a lot of moving parts, a lot of personalities. Yeah, I, I can't imagine what that industry is like. Yeah, a lot of hours. That's what it sounds like. Man, um, it'd be cool to come up and like sample one of your amazing dishes. So if anybody, any listeners don't know yet, this is Alan Burgo of ForagerChef.com. And uh, he blogs about uh, dishes that he makes that are partly foraged from the wild, which is really cool. And uh, does, does the restaurant um, just... Uh, what are, what are their regulations like on uh, foraged foods? Regulations? Uh, yeah, if any. As far as as far as mushrooms, you're supposed to be certified. Uh, I sat on a board with the uh, an advisory board with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and Department of Health to try to figure out what like what should those regulations be? How they, should they be regulated? What should curriculum look like and at the end of the day basically you find a you find a college or a place that's given some classes you take like a three-hour class you get a little ticket in the mail that says congratulations and then you can sell mushrooms gotcha <laughs> yeah yeah it's some people think it's pretty silly i mean down here in the southeast we've got uh, mushroom mountain that certifies people for uh, like a five hundred dollar course or something like that, but after that you can. Ethics. Yeah, you're you're expensive. Yeah, but it makes you legal, I guess, to sell. Uh, some people feel differently about that, but I've got a bunch of questions for you, man. So let's hop to it. All right, man. So can you tell me about your career leading up to become becoming executive chef at Lucia's? Well, before I became the executive chef at Lucia's, it was it was a long, a really long road. So I'll start kind of at the beginning and give you a synopsis. I started cooking when I was like 15. I was kind of a bad kid. I got grounded. So Grandma bought, brought me a cookbook while I was locked in my room. And then I started, to, it was Lydia Bastianich's uh, Italian food. Mm. So I started making homemade pasta. I thought that was interesting. Cool. Then I started working at fast food, mm. McDonald's, Hardee's, Pizza Hut. And after I had had enough of that, I decided I was going to go to like the best restaurant in the area, which was a crap restaurant. And I worked there for two summers, the last summer while I was going to college in the Twin Cities for business. And then I got kind of my break. And I got a job working for a chef from Rome in the Twin Cities. And it kind of started me on mm -hmm. my journey of working for a whole bunch of Italian chefs in the Twin Cities. So I ended up working for the guy Angelo was his name. He owned his own restaurant in Rome. I worked for him for two years. Then I worked for a guy from Milan for a year. Wow. Then I worked for a guy from Como who was the former personal chef to the Princess of Monaco. Worked for him for a year. Then I worked as the sous chef of another Italian restaurant that kind of collaborated with a, a friend of Angelo's who was a butcher from Rome. And I was there for two years. Then that place closed and I went to another Italian restaurant for a little while. And then I got contacted to open up the new Heartland restaurant, uh, which is a very, very well-known place in the Midwest that it was around for about 15 years. And I was sous chef there for four and a half years. We didn't use any any food that uh, came from greater than 200 miles of Minnesota. The menu changed every single day. Wow. And it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I think it, it had to be nominated for a James Beard Award for at least seven or eight years in a row. What's a James Beard so Award? After, it's kind of like an Oscar. Okay. Okay, gotcha in the culinary world sounds sweet so after that i opened up a restaurant called the salt cellar i was there as the executive chef for two years i closed that thing down and made it into a bar and grill then last year i took over lucia's which has been around for 32 years and it's kind of like the founding grandmother of like 
farm to table food in Minnesota and for the surrounding states. It's a very well regarded restaurant. Been around for a long time. Wow, man, that that is a crazy so that's story. The nutshell. Yeah, that. So you've had quite some training. Yeah, and I got a, I got a four year. Yeah, and a, a business degree in there somewhere, which is helping me out a lot. Oh, cool. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, it sounds like the necess- <laughs> the necessities. You got your cooking, but you know, a lot of artists are about you know the artists are about the art, or I guess you know culinars are about the the food and the culinary part. But you know, there's always the business you got to worry about. Some someone's got to someone's got to you know learn how to make it set off. So that's really cool. You got you got both ends Absolutely. covered. Absolutely. But holy cow, I heard something about a princess, uh, Monaco, you trained under or something like that. Man, that's amazing. Oh, just the the personal chef. Yeah, he was a jerk. (laughs) Okay, I believe you, I believe you. Oh, man, that that is a crazy story. I love that. So how long have you been blogging on ForgerChef.com, and why did you start the blog? Well, that kind of came about... It came about because I was interested in mushrooms, kind of first and foremost. So I'd been cooking at a place, the Italian restaurant uh, that was kind of, uh, that collaborated with the butcher from Rome. And my chef there would like to bring in interesting things like nettles, mushrooms, Mm. sometimes porcini. Oh, I think, actually, I think the only porcini we got there was a batch of bitters. And that wasn't cool. But I I got to see mushrooms come in. And I got just, you know, kind of spoon-fed all the basic, you know, widely available types. And then I was out frisbee golfing one day, and I saw a big chicken in the woods. And I said, I know what that is. I was cleaning that in the kitchen yesterday. And I brought it home with me. Then fast forward a couple years. Uh, if the line cooks don't make a lot of money, I was, I just started at Heartland and I was actually living in my friend's basement and I would go out before work every day and hunt mushrooms to bring them into Heartland and put them on the menu because I would help write the menu every day. And my, my roommate and my landlord said, Alan, this stuff is so cool. Like this, this food, I would make him breakfast every day. With you know, I'd I'd throw in stuff that I would find or whatever. He'd kind of be my guinea pig, and he said the stuff is so cool. Like you got to share this with people. And he was a he's a digital marketing professor at a local college around here. So he said we're going to do an experiment on you. Like we're we're going to make you a website. And I was cool. like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what year was I, that? I thought uh, I thought that was two thousand like mid 2012 I think okay and he said you know we're gonna we're gonna make you a website and, and we're gonna do it we're gonna see what happens and I was like oh, okay I didn't really know what it meant and I, I thought once we start the website then it's done right that's not that's really not how it works no it's not so that was a little bit of a rude rude awakening there and I think I, I rewrote like a hundred and a hundred plus thousand words like twice you know i'm not a writer i'm a i'm a cook so i like erase the blog and start it over at least twice really like after like seven or eight months or a year into it oh yeah and just rewrote the whole thing from the ground up that was a pain in the ass <laughs> but it sounds excessive but hey yeah. that's cool uh wow so man yeah exactly. wow. thanks so just because Four you're not five a... years, and I mean, I thought I was just going to talk to. Uh, I... Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. There, there's some really bad lag, but I was saying, like, I mean, you rewrote it twice. Um, what, what was uh, was it just because you didn't think you were a good writer, or you just, you just didn't... yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. But man, uh, that's it. You don't need to be to be on the internet. That's a beautiful thing. That's what I think. Like, I'm not the best writer. I'm not the best blogger. But I mean, if you have something to say then put it out there. I think that's what that digital marketer guy was telling you. He's just like, you have something to say, you got to put it out there. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hear that too. So basically, I thought I was going to be talking to like people in Minnesota about mushrooms. 
and, and that was going to be it, you know? Yeah. And then I started to see it was this, this, this amazing kind of genesis where in our off season, I'm talking to people from Australia and then I have people from China sending me recipes people from Massachusetts sending me mushrooms they've dried and like put in an envelope to send to me because they want to know what I think of them people from Alaska wow. doing the th same things people from uh, Veracruz in rural areas telling me that I have to come down and go on mushroom hunts because they're they're finding Matsutake uh, in, in a mountain in Veracruz in Bangladesh in, around the world it was not just contained in Minnesota and that that the human connection I mean that's just the amazing part of seeing that there's people around the world that are doing the same thing that I am like trying to go outside and getting excited to find some mushrooms and it's not you know it's not just in the United States and I knew it wasn't I knew it was big in Europe too but I did not really understand the global scope of you know, really, the the burgeoning mushroom industry. Yeah, wow. And hobby. Yeah, it, so. that's amazing. Like, you totally blew your mind, I bet, from China, Bangladesh. Uh, they, they must have some sweet recipes, first of all, but I've never heard of anybody sending mushrooms through an envelope. <laughs> Dehydrated. That sounds funny. Uh -huh. Yep. That's funny. Yep. Well, one friend of mine in particular likes to send, like, powdered samples of stuff and get me to make recipes with them. <laughs> that's strange that's strange man but hey, hey people do what they do um alright that's a great story on your website Forager Chef um so let's just talk a little bit of mushrooms just for the audience um you have a video man I wrote these questions a while ago but you had a video on half free morel identification um this was around when morel season was happening but uh, did you happen to hunt any morels this year? And what advice or tips do you have for people next year to find their own? Well, I tell you what, I did not get to hunt many morels. Mm. The the restaurant has really been consuming. I'm sure. And when I when I was a line cook, I had a lot more time in the mornings to to go out and you know I could I could get up at six and like hunt. For like five six hours yeah you know every day and then that that was great mm -hmm. but now i go into work a lot earlier and i stay a lot later so it has left precious little time for me to hunt mushrooms i hunted some morels with one of my friends and we and we got a good you know a good five six seven pounds this year that that was okay but what I'm really interested about, you know, involving morels, I'm really interested to see what happens with the decline of the elms. Mm, right. You know, I'm especially, especially in my in my area in, in the Midwest. You know, it's like morel land. Most of the time, if people think of a wild mushroom around here, it's like there can be only one, and it's that's the morel. And right. any other wild mushroom, you know, you're going to kill yourself and your right. whole family. <laughs> Yeah, you know, if it's not the morel, when the morels are actually more dangerous than something like chicken of the woods. I mean, for example, we got natural black morels that grow uh, up in northern Minnesota. When you kind of get up into taiga uh, terrain, mm -hmm. I think about like one in five people that I've seen get served to get horrendously sick Ooh. if they're did, and they're these are well cooked. Wow. Very, very well cooked. There's a there's an allergy to natural black morels, uh, the whatever species is up, up here in northern Minnesota, and people have a much higher chance of having an allergy to it than to a typical morel. People that had eaten, you know, your big fat blonde morels all their life came up to an event that I was at. Not the organizer, just a part of it. And uh, they, they came up had some of these black morels there's all kinds of people sick wow i've never heard of that i've never heard of that that's interesting yeah yeah yep. and it's the minnesota state mushroom so that's right. kind of funny because I mean, it's actually you know a little more dangerous than people think wow that's interesting you know i'm finding more and more as time goes on that uh um uh, i recently heard from 
somebody that the the chicken of the woods mushroom uh, has a uh, a one in one in ten people will have a bad reaction to it, and by most standards, that's considered an inedible mushroom at, at that rate. Um, so a lot, of, I, I, I'm really finding more and more as time goes on that it's a case by case basis, a lot of the time for these choice edibles. And it's, you can't yeah, really blanket it. Mean, that's one thing that that I have gotten to to get a good handle on is serving large amounts of mushrooms to people I can tell you I have never I've served I, I, I can't even count how many pounds of how many servings of chicken of the woods I've served to people I've never had anyone say there's a problem but I also know that chicken of the woods allergies for, from what I know are usually pretty mild and maybe it's a little like tingling in the tongue area yeah. I, I have not heard of a uh, like gastrointestinal issues from chickens, but that's back back to the morels. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens when with the decline of the elms, because around here where I am in the Midwest, it's all people look for elms. That's all they look for. And now you're you're not looking for like live elms. You're looking for sp like putrid elm skeletons, and the amount of them is less and less every year. You know, one of the one of the parks people like to go to, around around where I am, is you know, it has you know lots of old elm skeletons. This year, I saw a couple different people post about it on Facebook. They cut down like every old elm skeleton that they could see. Oh no! The, the DNR did the Department of Natural Resources. Yeah. So people are getting a little freaked out, like, what's going to happen? And what I think what my advice to people is, is that don't just think about elms. It's like, yeah, it's easy to look and find a dead tree. You, it's easy to see what a dead tree looks like in, you know, in the, the forest of things that are green. It's easy to find that things that sticks out like a sore thumb right. and it's a white dead tree. Mm -hmm. That's easy. Anyone can do that. And that's why there's so much competition for elm hunting morels, uh, is because it's like it's easy to find those elms. So what you need to do, at least where where I am in the Midwest, if you want to, you want to find more and you want to have a place that has less competition, you need to find a spot. My best morel spot is there's not an elm in a couple miles. Right. It's all cottonwoods. Mm. All cottonwoods. Very cool. And another thing I've been, yeah, another thing I've been hearing people say around here is that they've been, they've been seeing some around ash trees, and what some people have been saying is that the emerald ash borer is kind of like the Dutch elm disease of uh, the ash trees. Gotcha. So you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So that kind of the, uh, the heir to the elm throne, so to speak could be the ash tree as the emerald ash borer starts to really attack uh, populations of ash trees. And I think it'll be interesting to see if we start to see morels around dying ash trees. But I know my cottonwood spot, the morels just keep coming and they're not dead cottonwoods, they're living. So I think that's a really good tip. And it's, a, it's also one that I, I took from the greatest morel hunter that I've ever met. It's kind of a kind of an urban legend around the Midwest. Uh, a guy named Boyd that hunts the floodplains of uh, North and South Dakota and came in with a, a hundred pounds one day to the restaurant. Holy crap. Wow. Urban legend, yeah. huh? Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. But yeah, uh, you gave a lot of tips there for, for people trying to hunt them in your area. I guess you, you heard it here first, y'all. Uh, this guy, uh, the Cottonwoods. You might want to check out the Cottonwoods and the Ash Borer syndromes happening everywhere. I find it interesting because a lot of people will have like, yeah, it's all about elms, or in my area, it's all about tulip poplars or ash trees or something. But that's not that's not always the case, and a lot of people, some jerks will, get, will go even go and give misinformation or, or say that morel season ended early. You know, I, I, I saw that this year. They're like, all right, oh, they're gone, you guys. It's, you're, it's too late. But that, that's not true at all. When he was saying that, I went and found like my first couple pounds, and uh, like that was my first actual like. 
it was my first time hunting like on my own. I went with a small group the day before and found some tiny, tiny little guys. But my first time hunting, uh, I just listened to you know what people were talking about from my area, and bam, there was there, there was plenty. So to, p listeners should not uh, be fooled by misinformation. And uh, and uh, yeah, it, it will be interesting to see you know the, as I think you know climate change is happening right now. Uh, there's a lot of I mean, Dutch elm disease. The elms might be gone. Um, there's there's some pine beetles that are destroying massive populations of pine trees. So it's it's going to change us all all the ecology. So as long as you just study like the environment, you can you can find whatever. But that was a really cool story on your morels. Um, all right. So the chanterelle. What do I have for the chanterelle? What's your what's a what's your favorite chanterelle recipe that you have that you'd like to share? Well, I think the first recipe, like the the biggest thing that I tell people about chanterelles, it isn't really a recipe as more as like a way of thinking about cooking them. And one thing I noticed with like young young cooks or interns, first thing I did at Heartland. Uh, when I got there was clean with a brush 60 pounds of Oregon uh, Cantharellus formosus and then the next day same thing that was what I did for my first two days for like 20 hours was clean mushrooms with a brush and wow. after that then we, we brought them up to the line and they were getting sliced and then cooked and I've noticed that when you give uh, uh, mushrooms to someone to cook a lot of times like almost instinctively we just slice them up and fry them and depending on the size of your chanterelles that might be okay because I mean these Formosa chanterelles from Oregon they're great because they don't have bugs the flavor is not as good as the chanterelles from my area but they're like massive you know they're huge so slicing up those is okay but the best thing about a chanterelle is the size and the shape and showing that off and mm. kind of stemming from that cooking chanterelles whole as much as possible is the best way to cook them wow okay leaving leaving them whole so that you can show off their shape yeah. that is the greatest thing about a chanterelle because there is no other little mushroom that has that that the kind of picturesque little shape when you cook a whole a little button a little chanterelle button I mean maybe uh, hedgehogs you know are a bit similar too but chanterelles my favorite thing to do with them is just to heat up a pan and to cook them whole and maybe I throw a little bit of shallot in at the end maybe a couple of sprigs of thyme and then just a little bit of salt. And then I just take them when they're cooked, and I, I caramelize them, you know, in a nice hot cast iron pan. But then I just take them, and I just put them on top of something, or next to a little piece of meat, or something like that. And just don't really do anything to them, just cooking them whole, and enjoying them like that. It preserve. It's going to preserve their flavor better. Yeah. Uh, like if you slice up chanterelles and cook them with pasta, and you have like bacon, and herbs, and cheese in there, and onions. It's going to be really hard to taste those chanterelles when they're sliced up. When you leave them whole, you're going to eat that whole chanterelle, and you're going to get that pop when you eat them. And you can then pair them with more aggressive things like smoked ham, the bacon, uh, the onions, garlic, shallots, herbs. You can pair them with those more... Uh, aggressive flavors and you're still going to get that chanterelle flavor when you bite into them if you leave them whole wow man that's that's awesome i would have never thought you know when when my partner cooks food uh sometimes they'll comment on the way the food looks they're like oh i'm sorry it looks ugly i'm just like what what is that i don't care it's going in my stomach but like <laughs> pe but people who you know like people who actually care of it as a craft as an art that you guys actually take into consideration the way the way it looks but also, not only the way it looks, like you're right about chanterelles. When you dehydrate dehydrate them, they lose their flavor. So preserving the flavor in its within its own shape is uh, a great idea. I'm gonna have to give that a try. That's 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 really cool. Thank you for that. 
Yeah, and I don't like dehydrating chanterelles or hedgehogs. Yeah. The flavor is just kind of not the same. I mean, it kind of tastes mushroomy, but it's it's different to me. Yeah. I don't do it. What I what I do is I make something called conserve and we had talked a little bit before about do, making conserve with Ishnoderma. And the conserve method, which is on the website, is very simple, is I use it for any type of mushroom. And relating back to the chanterelles here, you will find if you, you conserve those chanterelles whole, the, you know, those little buttons, you're, they're still going to taste like chanterelles after they're pickled. So pickled mushrooms, you know, that's, that is the, I mean, to me, it's the best way to keep the texture of the mushroom cooked fresh. Freezing alters the way that mushrooms hold water mm -hmm. in their cell walls. Uh, that's why it's kind of important if you, if you want to freeze them, cook them beforehand, because there's less of that strange interaction. Mm. But doing conserve or pickling, pickling will keep the texture, but in a lot of recipes online, you see pickled mushrooms. There is so much vinegar in that crap. It is just, they try to kill the mushrooms with vinegar mm -hmm. because people are scared of botulism. But what, what's important to know is, okay, so what is the pH that I need to not have botulism in my pickled or preserved foods. And the pH is a little bit higher than people, than a lot of recipes really account for. So from, I shoot for 4.2 and I test stuff with the pH test strip. And if it's below 4.2, some people will do even go a little bit higher, like 4.6. I do 4.2, and if I know that if I see the liquid, if the pH is below 4.2, it is safe, and nothing's gonna happen to you. Uh, you can kind of test the pH just by tasting something. If you taste vinegar in a liquid, it's probably below 4.2. Mm -hmm. But my conserve recipe that I use for chanterelles and for for interesting mushrooms like Ishnoderma. It has a, a lower amount of vinegar in the recipe because the vinegar, in like like in these other pickled mushroom recipes, is just it's just unnecessary and it kills the flavor in favor of a sterilized product. So when you use a, a lower amount of vinegar, you can follow the the recipe is very simple. You can substitute a lot of different mushrooms in there. Use a lower amount of vinegar, you're going to get a lot better flavor. And it's it's basically my favorite way to preserve any mushroom. Gotcha. Wow, those are some great tips there, man. I had I had no idea cooks are using pH test strips on things. That's that's really cool. A lot of great tips, man. I really appreciate oh, yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We talked back to the, the Ishno uh, the Ishnoderma. I did another thing that was interesting with them the other day after I was talking to someone online they called it Salisbury steak of the woods I got a, I got a good laugh out of that <laughs> and I talked to I talked to another friend from the uh, Minnesota Mycological Society and they said that they had been using them to make broth and I thought man you know there's that little tender margin on the Ishnoderma mm -hmm. and then there's kind of the harder portion you know, what a great way to use them and use the entire the entire mushroom to take it and chop it up and take this kind of, some of this inedible portion and make broth from it. And I just, I thought it would just turn out really good as long as they're not very, very old and, yeah. you know, woody like the polypores can get. Mm -hmm. And that has become kind of my next favorite thing to do with them. It's It's almost a little bit like beef broth. And it's very dark, really, really great color on it. So I take some Ishnoderma, I chop them up into pieces, and I add a little, a little bit of uh, chopped onion, uh, maybe a, a small amount of chopped carrot, maybe 
a little bit of celery, a clove of garlic, nothing too much, nothing too crazy. And then I just basically cover everything until they look like little hippopotamuses in the water. I cover it with water. And then I bring it up to a boil, turn it down to a simmer, and I cover the pan. And I cook it like that for an hour or two. And the flavor of it is really, really good. It makes a great base for a soup or for ramen. It's a really cool way to use the ishnoderma like that. Yeah, that's really cool. I've, I've never heard of that. Um, wow, man, you, you're giving so much. I don't even cook. I don't, I don't, I'm not much of a cook. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of like you where I'm stuck at work a lot and I don't even actually have time to go out and hunt mushrooms. But I'm going to refer back to this video and try some of these, these things you're talking about because it's, it's way cool, way cool. I'm enjoying it. So um, I think, uh, what are we at? We're at... Uh, I don't know, we feel like we've been here like 30 minutes or so. Um, so, what is, you have foragerchef.com, but is there any social media that you're active on where people can reach out to you for things? Yeah, they can, my email's up on the website, and I'm at Instagram, it's at Alan Burgo. I don't use Twitter much. It's Basically, much. I use it. Basically, the video cut out, and we didn't catch the last little seconds of uh, the Forger Chef interview, so I'd like to just plug in his social medias right here. You can reach out to him on Instagram, at Alan Burgo. Also, follow him on Facebook, under Alan Burgo. Or check out his YouTube channel, Forger Chef, and uh, subscribe to those channels. Thanks for watching, guys, and while you're at it, subscribe to my own channel. Why not? Thanks. Talk to you later.